James for the for the uh, intro talk, and uh, let's move on to the uh, the next presentation. Uh, we have uh, you know uh, Jose Moreira from IBM, my colleague, is a distinguished research staff member at IBM uh, Research Center in um, uh, Watson Lab, um, and he received a BS degree in physics and BS and MS in electrical engineering from University of Sao Paulo. Uh, he received a PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champion. Uh, Dr. Morero is a fellow of IEEE and a distinguished scientist of, of the ACM. I welcome uh, Morero to give a uh, talk about uh, the power innovation and then the, the future of power. Uh, Jose Moreiro, please go ahead and start your presentation. Uh, thanks, Ganesh. And uh, let me start by sharing my screen um, and uh, make, make sure that my, you can, everybody can see my presentation. Um, is, that, is that visible now? It should say Power 10 Innovations for HPC. Looks good. Looks good. Looks good? Okay. So uh, thanks everybody. Thanks for all the participants and panelists. Um, I'll be talking today about some new features of the Power 10 processor, which is already announced, although not yet generally available. It will be generally available soon, uh, later uh, no, in a few months. And the um, uh, innovations that I'm gonna be talking where uh, uh, I, I, are, I believe of particular importance to HPC applications. Um, they, um, Power 10 is the work of many, many people. You know, uh, much of what I'm going to talk today is not really my work. I'll talk more about my own work later in the, in the, in the maybe in the second half of the talk. Um, many people work in Power 10. I listed here the people that I work more closely with. So these are my, like, you know, my more direct colleagues. But this is not, you know, the full list of people that work in Power 10. That list has hundreds and hundreds of people. So just are the people that I know better. <laughs> so they get to be in my chart. Um, so let's start with the, um, uh, the, the, the key features of the Power 10, uh, Power 10 chip. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a chip designed for enterprise applications or focused on enterprise applications. It's a, it's a large chip at 600 square millimeters. Although uh, that's not the largest that we could build because we actually have a, um, uh, a plan to put multiple, or we will be putting multiple chips in a single module. So we're going with a multi-chip multi, multi -chip module design, although it's really only a dual-chip module design uh, for some configurations and some other configurations will be a single-chip module. But the chip is 600 square millimeters, which, which is big enough. Uh, on those 600 square millimeters, we can put um, uh, 15 uh, SMT8 cores or 30 SMT4 cores. So that's the number of threads that each core can do. So either you can see a core as running eight threads, in which case we have 15 in a chip or, or 30 of the four threaded cores. Either way, you get 120 hardware threads per chip. Um, so like I said, some modules will be a single chip, some modules will be a dual chip, in which case you could get up to 240 hardware threads on a single uh, module, a single socket that goes into a motherboard. Uh, there is a very robust uh, data plane that interconnects um, uh, the cores, but also that interconnects the modules. Um, oops, I guess I must have this in timer. Uh, well, okay, I, I'm not sure how to stop that, but I'll, I'll, I'll just use the buttons here. So we, um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, the, we, we, we have a, a remarkable bandwidth, both from the, uh, the chip to the memory and between chips, uh, and we can build up to a 16 single chip modules, a glueless SMP. So a very large system with 16 of those chips, no glue whatsoever. There's integrated AI acceleration in the core. Uh, that is actually one of the things that I work more directly on. I'm gonna talk the, the second half of the, the talk. Um, security uh, features to prevent attacks from outside and inside. And we have delivered a significant boost in efficiency um, uh, over our uh, previous uh, processor, the Power 9, 
uh, we can get up to three times uh, the performance and uh, um, uh, of, of a Power 9 uh, module from a uh, Power 10 module. A lot of the gain is more cores. You now we have significantly more cores in Power 10, but Power 9, but we also get a more powerful core, which I'm going to talk. So the Power 10 interconnect, uh, ju just a moment, because I'm here alone with my son. Um, the, um, the Power 10 chip uh, has uh, the ability to connect with memory using the open memory interconnect, um, uh, the full terabyte per second of bandwidth from a chip to memory, and a full terabyte, uh, an additional terabyte per second from the chip to other chips, um, uh, whether it's, it's, it's through the SMP interconnect, which you can connect you know, multiple Power 10 chips, um, uh, through the integrated memory clustering, which we call memory inception, which I'll say a few words where you can interconnect multiple systems, or uh, to the attach, uh, to the open copy attach, where you can attach accelerators or storage class memory. So you have a full terabyte to memory, a full terabyte to other chips, whether they're power 10 or not, and you have about half a terabyte to IO, to the PCIe. So an enormous amount of bandwidth coming out of a single uh, power 10 chip. And, and we, we see that as being critical both for enterprise applications and for um, uh, the, the HPC applications as well. Um, um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the chip itself, if, if you were to look at the chip itself, you know, as, as I showed previously in, uh, in the slide, the cores are, are in the middle and on the um, uh, periphery here are the, um, are the interfaces to the, uh, to the outside world. The, um, uh, let me start here with the, on the right. Uh, on the, the big uh, vertical yellow bars are the memory interfaces, so they take much of the uh, uh, the, the outside of the of the chip. The, uh, the, the 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 perimeter of the chip is the the memory interfaces. On the corners, you have the power axon, which are the interconnect with the other chips. And what I haven't marked in yellow here, which would be on the top, on the bottom, are uh, no, PCIe and, and and other other stuff. So the chip is about, you know, half of it is half of it is compute and half of it is interconnect, which is you know, an interesting balance from a, a silicon perspective. Um, so uh, again, let's see the um, um, the, the memory, um, which we have one terabyte per second out of the chip, uh, can be used to connect to to the main tier DRAM. Um, in that initial offering. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna come with DDR4, uh, up to four terabytes per socket. So that's no, that's a lot of memory capacity. We currently uh, with DDR4 we can achieve 400 gigabytes per second of peak bandwidth. That will grow with DDR5. We we want more or less double that because the interface supports a full terabyte. So the uh, uh, even though the DDR4 can get about 400, DDR5 will get much closer to terabyte. And the power axon interconnect uh, allows us to build up to uh, systems with up to 16 um, uh, single chip modules. Again, that's also a terabyte per second. This is uh, this is whoops. Uh, this is what the um, uh, the OMI DIM looks like it's different than a uh, what you have seen in traditional uh, no traditional DDR DIMs in the bottom here. Uh, it's also different from the um, the usual buffer DIMs that IBM has used before, the Centaur DIMs, which uh, no are much bigger, have a much bigger buffer chip, they consume a lot more power. The OMI DIM is smaller. Uh, has a, a, a much more power efficient uh, buffer chip in the middle here, and uh, can can have uh, uh, no still very large capacity up to 256 gigabytes per dim. You now you put 16 of those in a socket. That, that's how you get uh, four uh, four terabytes. Um, so we can do. Uh, I talked about how we can com uh, uh, combine the chips into into single chip module. 
So the single chip module, which you know, has therefore 600 square millimeters of silicon, um, 18 billion devices on, on one piece of silicon. Um, it's, it's really focused on core and thread strength. It's the one that can, it can run faster because all the power of the, of the module goes into the one chip. Um, it has more capacity per, um, per chip because um, we, we get, gee, um, um, we, we get, we get 128, uh, uh, all 128 links at 32 meter transfers per second of the chip exposed to the module. Um, and, and you can scale, you now using the single chip module, you can scale to systems up to 16 sockets. So the way, the way you, you build the system of 16 sockets, you arrange them in a, in a, in a two dimensional topology, four by four topology. You do a direct connect between all the chips in the same column. Those are the green links and the direct connect between all the chips in the same row. So you can go from chip to chip, or in this case, since it's only a single chip module, module to module in, in two hops, right? You need, you need one hop on the vertical axis and one hop on the horizontal axis to go from any chip to other chip. The um, a dual chip module has twice as much silicon because dual, dual chip, so 1,200 square millimeters of silicon, much more than when we would have done with a single uh, chip. 36 billion devices. It's really aimed at throughput. We can pack a lot, no, twice the number of cores per module. We do have to run them a little slower. So whereas for single chip, we can run at four plus gigahertz, dual chip module, we can run 3.5, but still the total throughput is much higher. The memory per module is about the same. So we actually know in terms of, of, of memory throughput and memory capacity, it's the same whether it's a single chip module or a dual chip module. So of course, per core, you see a little bit of a loss um, as you go from a single chip to dual chip because the total is the same. Um, the um, uh, cluster interconnect is, is more, you have more ability to interconnect uh, with the dual chip module. So we, we, we can use a, a, a dual chip module in a up to four module configuration with direct connect. So the, you can see here the top, mod, top uh, left module has a direct connection with all the other three modules. So really is an all to all module interconnect uh, with a dual chip module up to four, um, up to four sockets. So this has a maximum of eight chips. This has a maximum of 16 chips. The, the dual chip module systems are also more optimized for size. You get more throughput per unit of volume with the dual chip module because the, the, the systems can be packed more efficiently. Uh, so before before I go to um, uh, talk about memory inception, which is a significant uh, new feature of power, and should I ask if there are any uh, any questions so far on what I've uh, uh, presented? There is a question in the chat window, but uh, please go ahead. You know, later on we can answer that. Uh, okay, you, you, read, you can read the question for me, Ganesh, or I can talk, or we can leave yeah, the question for later. Does P10 support the NVLink 3.0? So that's a, that's a very good question. So P10 uh, does not have the NVLink. So a connection with GPUs or a connection with uh, other accelerators would be either through PCIe or, or OpenCAPI. So um, let, let me talk about uh, memory inception. That is a new, uh, it's a new feature of Power10. It's, I believe, uh, one of the first uh, uh, systems to support this concept of memory inception, um, sorry, of uh, memory disaggregation. Memory disaggregation is, is a concept that has been around for a while. It's the idea that a processor in a server, in a machine can use the memory from another machine. So essentially your cluster of, uh, of machines forms a pool of processors and memory, which can be dynamically configured. You, you, have, you, have not, you have not only the memory of your machine to use, you have the memory of your cluster to use. So uh, this really provides load store 
facilities load store capability between a processor on one machine and the memory on another machine. So it's a shared load store memory amongst directly connected neighbors within a pod. Uh, the, the interconnect is a nearest neighbor interconnect, um, but it can be multi-hop. So it's uh, though um, uh, in this in this particular figure that I have here, uh, the uh, the machines are all connected uh, to each other directly, but um, you you can form a multi-hop topology and you can have very large uh, very large uh, you know, systems with you no know, thousand machines for example, thousand servers. Um, it has uh, low latency when you go to a remote memory. Um, it is NUMA, of course. The memory that is on your own machine is 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 at a near closer distance, you no know, shorter uh, uh, load time than memory in a uh, 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 in a remote machine. But you do have the ability to load store all of them. So, what would be an example configuration here? Let's say I I build a system with eight or a pod. We call them a pod with eight. Uh, eight machines, uh, these are independent machines, each one with eight terabytes. So I have eight machines with eight terabytes each or 64 terabytes total. And um, I have a, a certain workload, let's say a workload A, which uh, you know, relatively small four terabyte memory requirement. So what do I do? I run the workload A on one machine and I use the memory that is attached to that machine. So you, you can see here on the top, workload A is using uh, you know, four terabytes. So each one of those uh, units is, is meant to represent a terabyte um, of memory um, uh, from its own machine. Um, workload B needs 24 terabytes, but it, it doesn't have much latency requirement. You can tolerate a little bit increase of, of latency. So I run workload B on another machine and I don't use any of the machine's memory for B. I, I put some of the some of the memory of workload A in the first machine in the top machine and I distribute some of the uh, memory of workload B in the other machines. So you can see here six different machines contribute memory to workload B Interesting enough, none of the memory comes from the machine where workload B is actually running, where the processors of, uh, of workload B are. And then workload C is a hybrid. It, it requires a certain amount of memory with low latency. Uh, it, it can tolerate a, a little bit uh, higher latency on the other amount of memory. So some of its memory comes from its own machine. You see the third machine from the top. So workload C, eight terabytes come from its own machine. And uh, the other uh, 16 terabytes come from different machines. So a, a single application uh, running on a single machine can address up to two terabytes of actual physical memory. Um, obviously not all of those terabyte of memory come from its own machine, so some would come from its own machine and some would come from other machines that are interconnected with it. Um, so this this is this is one one example of configuration where you can have you no know, multiple workloads in a in a in a in a pod sharing the total memory of the pod. Um, uh, the, the memory can also be used for communication between uh, the, uh, the machines. So you can you can you know, write memory. Uh, one machine can write memory. The other machine can read memory. Then memory is not cache coherent. So it has to be done, this communication has to be done carefully, but it, it, it's one way to achieve you no know, very high speed communication between different machines in the same pod. Um, any, any questions about uh, uh, memory inception? We just uh, know it's, it's a feature that has been in the works for a while. Um, uh, uh, the uh, the activities have not started with Power10, but Power10 is the first machine to actually implement it, the first processor to actually implement memory inception. And we uh, we believe it's one of the more, um, uh, let's say, revolutionary innovations of, uh, of Power10. Any um, any questions before I move on to the next? Uh, yeah, there are there are two questions on the Q&A uh -huh. Yeah, uh, Jogesh Singh, uh, is asking about are we moving into the world of interconnected 
uh, you know the nanometer size chips could a fpgas be deployed for accelerating more heterogeneous architectures well um fpgas can certainly be deployed using the open capi um uh, uh, inter interface um, they, uh, they, they can be deployed with, with Power 9. They will be continue to be deployable with in, in, in Power 10. Um, there is more bandwidth now between Power 10 and uh, OpenCAPI attached accelerators than there was with Power 9. So I think, uh, I think FPGAs continue to be a, 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 a good way to build for a special purpose systems with Power 10. Does that, does that answer the question? Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jose. And also one more question from Federico Ficarelli. Um, regarding memory in, in, inception, does the kernel running the workload know, the, know about remote memory pages, just like they, they were residing on very distant NUMA nodes? Yes. So uh, that, that is a very good question. And yes, the, the, the behavior is definitely NUMA. And the behavior is, is, is NUMA... Um, Multi levels of NUMA because you can uh, you you can have systems that are single hop away, which are a little bit slower than your own memory, or you can have uh, systems that are many hops away, which would be slower than than than, than, than your local uh, memory, right? So you need to be NUMA aware uh, while allocating, and that was the intent of show here in uh, workload C, where we do have, uh, for example, eight terabytes, which is known to have low latency and it's allocated in the same machine as the workload C itself is running, and 16 terabytes of relaxed latency, which are in, in different machines. Um, the, uh, the, 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 soft, the system software uh, uh, will have to know about the, the different uh, latency characteristics of memory. Um, um, uh, to, to, to the best of my knowledge, memory inception software will not be ready at uh, product GA. So it's not a feature for uh, that will be, um, from a software perspective, will not be immediately enabled on, on the first systems coming out of IBM. Um, so there might still be some software work to be done. The hardware is fully enabled. You know, Power 10 comes out. Uh, the, the first Power 10 chips that we have are capable of doing memory inception. Uh, but the software still needs needs some work, and some of that work is exactly um, no uh, 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 enablement of NUMA behavior and knowledge of NUMA behavior and allocating uh, the right page at the right distance with the right link. Yeah, one more question from uh, yes. thank you. Uh, one more question from Daniel Cesarani. Uh, uh, which fabric uses the memory inception to interconnect nodes? Oh, um, the, uh, the the memory inception is is part of the axon fabric. Sorry, let me go back here. So the 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 local memory is the OMI memory fabric. It's it's one terabyte per second dedicated to local memory. The power axon, which is again one terabyte per second total, is shared between interconnecting multiple chips in the same machine, uh, interconnecting open CAPI attached devices and for the memory inception. That's integrated memory clustering arrow here. That's, that's the memory inception. So that comes out of your power axon, one terabyte per second budget. It does not come out of your one terabyte per second OMI memory budget. You always have you no know, one terabyte per second for memory. Even though, as I said, the DDR4 memory that we're beginning with only uses 400 out of that terabyte. Does that, does that answer the question, Ganesh? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, okay. that's right. Thank you. We can move on. Move, move on. Okay. So let me talk about overall performance. Um, so we, we, have, um, um, uh, we have measured and uh, no, estimated and measured uh, with, with the... Um, no, the most recent silicon, a, a general workload speed up of up to 3x uh, or approximately 3x uh, compared to the Power9 uh, baseline. So if the Power9 baseline, which is a 24 core uh, 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 SMT4 core uh, Power9 module, so that would be a, a, 20, uh, 24, a 96, uh, uh, 96 hardware thread 
um, uh, Power 9 system is a one. If you look at the performance of Power 10 on integer enterprise and floating point um, uh, uh, applic benchmarks or applications, it's, it's about three times faster per module. Now the Power 10 module, this is a, a DCM. So it has uh, 60 SMT4, up to 60 SMT4 or so. It, it's a significant higher number of cores. Um, so 2.5 times the number of cores. But no, we, we, get, we also get an improvement. We get about a 30% improvement on per core. So you go from no 24 cores to 60 cores. The cores get 30% faster. Um, you do have to run the frequency a little slower because we didn't you know, uh, change the, the power that much. Um, um, uh, we, we, get, um, we, we get about a three, three-fold improvement in, um, uh, in socket performance. The memory bandwidth with uh, DDR4, which is the first uh, generation of memory, is about two times faster than, than Power9 um, uh, bandwidth but we will get to double that performance with DDR5. So DDR5 will, will really be better than 4X, the memory bandwidth of, of Power9 per, per module. On the um, um, uh, specific uh, set of, uh, of applications that can be accelerated by our uh, matrix engine, which I will talk uh, next, or, or in a few slides, I'll start talking about the matrix engine that we introduced in, um, uh, in Power10. We do get speed ups of about 10x and sometimes more. So um, we see that, for example, if the power nine, that's the, the right chart there. If the power nine baseline is one, our link pack performance has gone up by 10x per module. Um, again, that's no 2.5 times the, uh, the number of cores, four times per core. So a total of 10x per module. Uh, inference on ResNet 50 has gone up by 10 times if we use single precision. If we use the new data types supported by our matrix engine, our matrix engine supports no, from int four bit integers to double precision floating point. Um, that's why you get the boost on link pack. That's why you get the boost on uh, ResNet 50 floating point, but you get <clears throat> even bigger boosts with B float 16 and int eight, reaching 15 X or 20 X, the performance of a power nine uh, module to module. So 24 cores of power nine versus 60 cores of power 10. So the core itself um, is, is you no know, was, was a you know, key uh, feature of power 10, uh, essential for our big performance gains. Um, we, uh, we have an SMT8 core, which is significantly improved over the um, SMT8 core of power nine, or if you compare SMT4 to SMT4, it's just the same ratio of improvement. <clears throat> so we got a 2.6x performance per watt improvement. 30% comes from average performance improvement. 50% is the power reduction. So you cut, you cut the power in half, you increase uh, performance by 30% per core. So you get a 2.6x performance per watt improvement. And the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the units that have been uh, uh, um, accelerated or enhanced for HPC and, art and, and AI computation include the matrix uh, accelerator, the MMA. Uh, we have twice the number of SIMD. Uh, we didn't change the SIMD width. We still use 128 bit factors, but we can do four uh, SIMD instructions per cycle per SMT4 core, eight per SMT8 core. So a very high bandwidth uh, SIMD uh, infrastructure. We double the load store bandwidth per core for SMT4 core, and we quadruple the amount of uh, L2 cache. So significant gains in uh, cache, in uh, bandwidth, in, in throughput as compared to Power9. So this is the um, uh, this what is shown here is uh, uh, an SMT organization of an SMT4 core. You can see it has four execution slices, each one a full 128 bit wide. That's why we can do four uh, SIMD instructions per cycle for our SMT4 core. Um, the data cache is 32 kilobytes, eight way. That has changed so in, in size. The L2 cache has improved to one megabyte per SMT4 core. That's a, that's a, that's a 4X gain. Uh, instruction cache, he grew. 
We have a 48 kilobytes per uh, uh, SMT4 core. The TLB has increased. The uh, load queue and miss queues all have everything has increased. No, almost everything has increased significantly. Uh, and uh, maybe the biggest introduction is this whole new unit, the matrix engine, which can produce two 512-bit uh, results per cycle. Uh, I'll talk more about the matrix engine, uh, but it's, it's, it's a new functional unit. It complements the SIMD unit. So you have four SIMD units plus the matrix engine. And um, um, uh, the core can uh, decode uh, an issue, the, uh, can fetch, decode, dispatch an issue up to eight instructions per cycle. There are limits on what those instructions can be. You cannot do eight, for example, you cannot do eight SIMD instructions per cycle because we only have four units, but you can do four SIMD instructions and four load store instructions per cycle. That is, that's a possibility. Um, you can also do two SIMD and two matrix instructions per cycle. You cannot do two matrix and four SIMD that you don't have enough uh, uh, fetch ports on the registers for that, but you can do two and two. So there are different combinations. Now we've certainly seen uh, very high uh, IPC applications running on, on, on Power10, particularly in the SMT modes. So let me talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the matrix engine. Um, and, any questions before I start that part? That's the part that, uh, that, that's more no, uh, my, my own work. So I can, uh, I, I can spend a lot of time on this, but I'm conscious that I have about 15 minutes here. So I'll, I'm only gonna spend 15 minutes, but before I go to this part, I will uh, you know, ask if there's any other questions on the previous parts that I talked about. If not, okay. So the, the matrix uh, uh, engine or the matrix unit in Power10 is tightly integrated. It's part of the core. It's, it's really another functional unit. It takes uh, two kinds of, uh, uh, of, 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 of data. It uses vectors that comes from the traditional vector scalar register file in Power. So it, it fetches, in this example here, it fetches uh, uh, two vectors, an X vector and a Y vector. Uh, I'll, I'll talk what we can do with three vectors, um, but it fetches two vectors from the vector scalar register file and uses those vectors to compute an outer product. So it has four elements of X, four elements of Y, and it does an alt wall. So it does 16 uh, multiplies of X0 with Y0, Y1, Y2, Y3, X1 with Y0, Y1, Y2, Y3. And it forms that four by four matrix as the outer product of two vectors and uses that matrix to update a four by four accumulator. Uh, so the, there's a little, there's a four by four matrix that comes from an accumulator register. And um, using two vector registers, it does a, a rank one update of the matrix. So it's, it's, a, it's a blast two operation rank one update where the accumulator is updated with the outer product of two vectors an X, Y transpose plus the current value of the accumulator and you write back to the accumulator. So again, the one dimensional input vectors come from the main register file of all, like all the other vector instructions in Power10 and the two dimensional accumulator resides in a, in a local unit. It's local to the unit. It's local to the uh, matrix engine which means there is very little cost in moving that accumulator, very little latency in moving the accumulator in and out of the unit because it's already there. The example here is for 32-bit data type, right? We have 128-bit vectors, so it's a four 32-bit uh, element vector. If we have reduced precision, meaning either a 16-bit floating point or 16-bit integer, 8-bit integer, 4-bit integer, then in a single 128-bit register, you, 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 don't, you don't get one vector, you get multiple vectors and you do multiple rank updates. So you do a rank K update in general, where a K is one for single precision or uh, two for 16-bit inputs, four for eight-bit inputs and eight for uh, four-bit inputs. We can also do uh, uh, double precision. In is, uh, uh, I think I have another slide on double precision, but in double precision, the accumulator is still the same size accumulator. So instead of being a four by four is a four by two. We use two vectors for the X 
and one vector for the Y. So we actually use all three vectors that we can fetch from the vector scalar register to do a rank one update in double precision. So rank K updates can be exploited by a variety of computational kernels. Blast two and Blast three and Blast two are the obvious choices. So we've done that in uh, Open Blast and Eigen are already released with MMA support, the matrix math accelerator um, support. So those, those are available in open source. We also have uh, demonstrated using the run K updates and sparse matrix operations. I'll say a few words about SPMM. We've done that. Um, direct convolution, discrete, discrete Fourier transforms, tensor computations represent other operations can be accelerated with run K update. Direct convol I mean by direct convolution is you, you don't you don't transform convolution into gem, which is kind of the normal way to do it. You you just directly do the convolution without forming the um, uh, the, the explicit using image to column to form a matrix and then calling gem. You don't you skip all that. You just do the convolution directly on the image. You can do that with run K update. So uh, the uh, the new matrix math instruction. So we have the eight accumulators. So the eight accumulators, each one is a four by four matrix of 32 bit elements or four by two matrix of 64 bit elements, depends how the, the, the instructions you're using. The accumulators are new uh, state, but for purposes of the operating system, they overlap uh, for each one of them over, overlaps four of the VSRs. So today, when you use an accumulator, you cannot use the corresponding VSRs. So if you use all eight accumulators, you block 32 VSRs. Fortunately, in power, we have plenty. We have 64 VSRs. So you always have eight accumulators plus 32 VSRs to express your code, which is, which is really plenty. Um, so the um, uh, let me let me keep going because I want to leave time for questions. Again, so if it's a, if the inputs are thirty two bits, you do a, a four element column vector by four element row vector, and you update a four by four matrix as the accumulator. If your elements are sixteen bit, you have a four by two matrix times a two by four matrix. So you do a rank two update each instruction, updating again a four by four matrix of 32-bit elements. We can also do 8-bit um, elements. Uh, so you have a four by a little four by four matrix. No, four by four, a four by four matrix of eight bits just fits into a 128-bit register. So you can do now your instructions will do a rank four update. And with um, um, a four bit uh, elements, you actually do a four by eight by eight by four matrix. So do a rank eight update. The data being um, updated is always a four by four accumulator of 32 bit elements. That's important to remember. The only exception is in single precision, in double precision, then it's a four by two um, matrix of, of double precision elements. Um, <clears throat> so for integer data, we can handle 16, uh, then this is the input data, no 16 bit data, eight bit data, four bit data. Um, uh, you do the X, Y transpose, which is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the essentially the matrix multiplication, and optionally you accumulate, meaning you can you can just write the result of the multiplication, or you can you can add to what's already there. Um, and again, the result here is is four by four of thirty two bit integer data for floating point data. Um, uh, it's it's the X and Y transpose optionally negated and optionally plus or minus the current value on the accumulator. So there are four variants plus the variant that doesn't accumulate, the variant that just takes the uh, the uh, the product. Um, uh, we also have choices of arithmetics for integers. So integer, you can do saturating arithmetic or not, or modular arithmetic. For 16-bit floating point, you can do B-float 16 or IEEE 16-bit. Uh, single precision and double precision are always um, um, uh, IEEE, of course. Um, programming with the MMA is primarily today done with uh, uh, built-ins. So you have uh, these uh, C function calls that mimic uh, one of the instructions. So you don't have to write an assembly, means you don't have to do instruction scheduling, register allocation, 
You don't have to worry about saving volatile register, non-volatile registers. The compiler takes care of that. There's all the scheduling, all the optimization. But you do program directly saying these are the operations that I want to do in each of the um, uh, for, for each of my data. And the uh, and the intrinsics or, or the, the built-ins, I should say, they are really built-ins. Uh, they always take an accumulate. The arithmetic built-ins they take the accumulator, which is being updated, and the x and y vectors. So this is what the code looks like for a, for a DGEM. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a DGEM here. Uh, I'm using the eight accumulators that I have. Remembering that for double precision, the accumulator is just a four by two matrix. So I use my eight accumulators to form a virtual eight by eight accumulator of double precision numbers. So this is an eight by eight accumulator of double precision uh, numbers. So it's a software construct. And I'm going to use um, eight elements in X and eight elements in Y to do an outer product, essentially an eight by eight outer product. Uh, no, the instructions themselves only do four by two outer products. So it takes eight instructions. You can see here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight instructions. Um, each one takes either a, uh, a double vector for the X or this, which is four elements. Or a single um, or a single vector, two elements for the y. And uh, and I can do a, an eight by eight uh, outer product uh, using eight instructions. So my loop just goes through you no know, fetching uh, two uh, uh, double vectors for x, four single vectors for y. And thus, um, eight uh, outer four by two outer products to simulate an eight by eight outer product. Um, uh, the code generated is fairly tight, so this is the code that is generated. The, you, essentially, each each built in becomes um, uh, an, a, a machine instruction, and you can see the branch here back to the beginning. So very tight loop. Um, in terms of performance. Oops, um, Again, relative to power nine, actually this is absolutely this is flops per cycle in double precision. So power nine here in green, um, uh, power 10 using just the vector instructions in orange, that's already two times faster than power nine that was expected. We have twice the single throughput in power 10 as power nine. So the, um, um, uh, the performance should double and the performance with the matrix engine is, is more than double uh, no, the black is more than double of the orange. So it's about five times, uh, a little bit less than five times, I think, or I mean, close to five times of power nine. Problem size, no, increases here from 128 to 16K. Doesn't really um, uh, uh, change performance much. We get up to 26 uh, flops per cycle per core in double precision, uh, irrespective of the problem size. This is an n by 128 by a 128 by n matrix, so a fairly small, the inner dimension fairly small. This is LinkPack, which uses this uh, DGM as, as the basis. And you can see here, we're still increasing the performance as the problem size grows. As the problem size grows, more of the percentage of LinkPack is the DGM um, eventually becomes completely DGM dominated. But again, you see a significant gain. Uh, about 4x from power 9 and about 2x from power 10 with vector instructions by using the uh, the matrix instructions on impact. Um, so this is the, um, uh, the and the core and all this was done with very little impact to, to core power. In fact, uh, power 9 in blue here, uh, if the relative power is 1, uh, power 10 has lower power per core than, than power 9. And power 10 with MMA has only a slightly more power per core than power 10 without the MMA. So very small cost of enabling the MMA, and yet your performance doubles or more than doubles uh, from using the MMA. So very good power efficiency from there. Uh, like I said, we have um, we have successfully used the matrix engine to accelerate uh, sparse computations. This is joint work with our collaborators, Sharif Yassil and Joseph Torellas at the University of Illinois. Sharif is the one that devised this uh, new matrix representation where he takes a sparse matrix and, and splits into a, a blocked part, which is well suited for computation of the matrix units, and a traditional CSR part, 
which is executed in the vector unit. So it splits the matrix into two parts. And you can see here in magenta and yellow, how using the MMA provides a big boost in performance over the plain CSR representation, which is in blue here. So this is percent of peak flops. And um, uh, no, in, in, in some cases, the, uh, the MMA, which is the magenta and the yellow, can get up to twice uh, the performance of the, uh, the CSR representation. We have got close to a, a teraflop on an SPMM computation. In fact, using faster processors that we have now, we have gone from 3.6 to 3.9 gigahertz in the lab and we'll go faster. We have uh, actually seen better than a teraflop on a sparse matrix uh, uh, multiplying using uh, using Power 10, which is a significant gain from the 250 or so that we saw in, in Power 9. So Power 10 is the latest generation of power systems processors, um, shows big improvements in compute, memory interconnect, and power efficiency, has more memory bandwidth and more vector processing for, uh, for high performance computing. The uh, matrix unit we really see as a, as a game changer, although it requires programming. And we have been able to achieve uh, uh, amazing new levels of performance in a broadening space of application. The advanced tool chain, where you can generate code for Power10 native and cross compiler, so you can run on any machine you have, you can, you can get from GitHub. And there's a functional simulator. And then again, in a few months, there will be real Power10 available uh, uh, for, for people to use. Um, thanks everybody. If uh, people have any questions, I'll be happy to entertain. I, I don't know, Ganesh, how I'm doing with, with my time. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, a little bit more, but that's why that's fine, Jose. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Really uh, appreciate it. And uh, uh, audience, if you have any questions, please go ahead and you know raise your hand or you can uh, put it in the chat window or a QA and a session. Um, Dr. Jose will uh, answer your questions. Okay. Uh, again, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Jose for uh, your wonderful uh, presentation of uh, you know about uh, the power chain innovations. And uh, you know, I think this is the future of you know the enterprise world. And uh, you know, and also uh, definitely you know there are a lot of other things also will come up. You know, using